we had a peculiar moment in American history. But as in the first Reconstruction, we saw a period of penal servitude. In the wake of this second Reconstruction, we see what Michelle Alexander described in her book, The New Jim Crow, a period of mass incarceration. Interesting that in the wake of these two reconstructions, we see a rollback of the right to vote and a rollback of the right to walk freely, unincarcerated, uncriminalized, unvictimized by the criminal justice system. What do we have now at this moment in American history? 2.3 million Americans behind bars, one out of every four adults with a criminal record, 65 million Americans with a criminal record, one out of every three young people being arrested by the age of 23, a person with a record of incarceration losing $100,000 in their prime earning years, a criminal justice problem of such size, such sweep, such scope that it costs our economy $53 billion a year. And lest you think that this is a problem for them somewhere else in some other community, I might remind you that this is a multi-hued, multi-ethnic, multi-racial challenge, the likes of which we cannot ignore. Here we are at this peculiar moment in history, possibly a third reconstruction. And so we ask ourselves this afternoon at Cabrini College, what exactly will we do? Will we be co-creators of history or mere captives of history, swept along by the tide of inevitability, overwhelmed in a sea of fatalistic conclusions as to what we can do and what our possibilities are? Or will we live out the credo, the mission, the history of this college that is dedicated and predicated to the notion that social justice can be made real? I'd like to suggest to you that if history is any indication, if your presence here today is any indication, we will rise up and we will be co-creators fashioners of our own history. We will take the pen of history and write a new conclusion, write the tale of a third reconstruction. Why? Because we're well able to do that. Now you say to me, wait a minute, are students capable of this kind of advocacy? May I share with you a story about a woman by the name of Pauli Murray? Pauli Murray was a student at Howard University Law School, not too much older than you are now. She had the temerity, the moral boldness to suggest to her august, esteemed, and more experienced professors that we can bring separate but equal to an end in a generation. And then she had the guts, some of you who know, who know what it's like to crank out a term paper at the last minute. Now, I know nobody here understands that, but. That was my life as a student. Last minute, late at night, much caffeine. <laughs> she wrote a paper outlining a strategy of defeating separate but equal. Turned the paper into a book. Thurgood Marshall referred to it as the Bible of state segregation laws. It was used as a roadmap to Brown versus Board of Education. They relied on the scholarship of a student to turn the table of American history. That's what you're capable of. Now, lest you think that, 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 that her activism was relegated to her student days, this same woman graduated at the top of her class at a time when women were not recognized. She was entitled to a scholarship to Harvard Law School. The president of the United States intervened on her behalf. But because she was a woman, she couldn't get the scholarship. Eleanor Roosevelt intervened on her behalf as the first lady. She couldn't persuade the august leaders at Harvard to give this bright woman a scholarship. She went out to the University of California, Berkeley, got a master's in laws, then went to my alma mater and got a, a, a JSD, a PhD, if you will, in law. And then became the first 
African-American woman as a priest in the Episcopal Church. The point being here is if you have it now, if you have courage now, if you have guts now, if you have moral imagination now, you can change the world now and in the future. That's what you have as students. 